Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Complete Music Media's podcast. I'm your host, Darren Campbell, on the Complete Media Network. We are excited today. We're uh, blessed with a very special guest. Uh, we can't wait for this. We've been anticipating this for weeks and weeks, and uh, we finally have him here. Uh, our guest today is Corey White, a really good friend, fantastic dad, all around really great guy. But why we have him here today is he is the lead singer for the band Showcore. And we're going to talk music. We're going to show some of his uh, creations and have a lot of fun in the process. So uh, uh, please put your hands together. Welcome, uh, Corey White. Thanks a lot, buddy. I uh, really hey, appreciate you coming in. Oh, no worries. No worries. Blessed day. Eh? I don't know if you're blessed, buddy. <laughs> I wouldn't call it blessed. <laughs> Nobody's blessed to hang out with me, pal. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. All right. Uh, you're yeah, way so too I, modest. You know, when I watch some of your other podcasts, you know, there's some of the sports stuff. You know, I'm not a big sports guy myself or whatever. But, but pretty interesting stuff, man. I like what you got going on. It's pretty Good. cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks yeah, for the we're feedback. Good. Yeah, we're having fun. We, uh, I'm a huge sports fan big music lover uh wanted to start in the sports vein because uh that's what i uh watch and listen and follow on a daily basis but music uh really uh saved my life energized my soul really uh helped me in my angsty days as a teenager with you know so much aggression so much uh, anger uh, all the things i needed and uh hard rock metal music really seemed to be my therapy was the way that I could get my outlet and my release. And it, it really saved my life, I think. Uh, how about you? Did music save your life? I don't know if it saved my life. I wouldn't say, I, uh, I mean, it was a different thing. Like I always wanted to be, you know, in a band, I always wanted to be a musician, but um, I was lazy, man. I was a lazy teenager. So like I took up the bass uh, and, and I practiced, but like, you know, I left it at my buddy's house and, and, and like after a week, he was better than I was after playing for like three years. You know, I was just oh, wow. was one of those things. And so my bass teacher was like, you know, you should be a singer, man. You should be a singer. And I was like, I don't, I can't really sing. I don't want to, you know, that's not my thing. And, and then I, I don't know what sort of, I just sort of gave up on the dream of actually being a musician, being in a band. And, and when I got into high school, I, to, I, I totally went down your path, you know, the radio thing. I was like, you know, if I'm not going to be able to create music, I want to, I want to be around music, kind of do something involved with music. Right. And so, uh, so I, I talked my way into a job at a radio station. I just kept phoning the PM. Hey, Hey, until I could get a hold of the guy. And then he invited me for an interview. And he's like, so, um, you know, so what, what do you want to do here? And the station was called coast. Uh, 800 at the time and David Marsden was the guy who's uh, you know synonymous with radio in Canada big uh, big big name in radio in Canada I started CFNY in Toronto actually um, so so uh, and, and so I was sitting in his office and I'm just a you know pimply kid from like, just out of high school you know and uh, and he's like so you know what do you want to do and I'm like looking around his office and kind of seeing what he's got going on and he's answering the phones and he's doing stuff and I was like what do you do <laughs> he's like well I'm the program director I decide what happens I said I'd like to do that <laughs> <laughs> nice he's like whoa whoa, whoa <laughs> kid <laughs> hang tight there how about we put you on midnight till six just playing music and not talking and I was like perfect those are my hours man nice so, uh, nice so then I started doing that man midnight till 6 a.m and, and, and they just you know I think they called the shift operator shift or something like that. And, and I just played music and didn't talk and played commercials and shit from, from midnight till 6am, uh, you know, five days a week or whatever it was. And, and, and then finally um, uh, I noticed that the little, the little van that had the logos on it outside wasn't drive, wasn't moving anywhere. So I knocked on his door and I said, Hey, can I drive the van? He's like, you want to be the fabulous prize, babe? I was like, well, I guess so. <laughs> Look at me. Hey, if you check me out. I'm a fabulous project kid. <laughs> so, uh, nice. so he gave me the job driving around uh, and, and giving out prizes and doing cut-ins. And that was the big thing for me was like, I, then I got to be on the radio, you know? And I started to like, I really liked it. I, I, I played with the whole theater of the mind thing, you know? For me, it was like, that was kind of the fun part of it. I would write these little, uh, it was all writing for me too. It wasn't very good at off the cuff stuff. So I, I like to write my cut-ins out so that I could, and I'd have people from the street come and play characters in them and stuff. So I'd do things that have, back then it was a cell phone attached to a cord in the front of the van, you know? Sure, and, yeah. uh, 
All right. The back of the van is the back of the van is where I took the victims. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, not really. Um, but anyway, so so I got the uh, I got the the cell phone and I have like the person I was going to do my parts with beside me and then we you know play our parts and stuff and and I try to make little interesting one minute to you know minute and a half little cut-ins from different places and, and promote concerts and give away prizes and I got to go to all the shows for free and that's when. I got to take some of my friends with me who were musicians at the time from back in where I grew up in Langley to a bunch of shows. And so they could meet people. We could all network and stuff like that. And, and, and eventually uh, that turned into me uh, uh, getting into a situation where there was a bunch of guys who had started a band and they were kind of looking for something different, something new. Like they wanted to add a second singer to the band. And so, uh, I just happened to be a hangaround. I was just the, the guy who was coming to drink beer at the rehearsals. No talent, no nothing. Just a kid who drank beer and hung out and said, that's cool. And they're like, he grabbed the mic. And I was like, whoa. So I did, man. And, and, and then I started to like, I don't know, get into it. And it just sort of blossomed. And that was that, that band was DDT. And uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was my first thing, man. It was cool. Yeah. So well, music kind of didn't save my life, but it, like I say, it was a big sort of, sorry, that was a long story for, you know, what it was, but yeah. No, no, I appreciate the the background. Uh, a lot of us, um, you know, want to, you know, start thinking we want to do something and then, you know, get a little side shift and then all of a sudden back here. And uh, like you said, I, I walked into a radio station and said, uh, I'm interested in working here, um, you know, to do something. And they said, well, uh, what department? And I said, sports, I guess, and maybe music, something. And they said, um, well, our sports guy's not showing up today. Would you like to be on the air in an hour? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, pardon? Uh, what are you <laughs> talking about? And they're like, yeah, just do a little five minute thing about the world of sports and you know boom yeah i said um okay i guess i can do that and i'm sure i did a horrible job but uh you know all of a sudden wow they gave me that spark they gave me that you know okay here i, I could do that well if i practice if i worked at it you know maybe i can do more and so then i started you know looking at guys like you said you know looking at some of the people around the station. Oh, maybe I'd like his job. Maybe I'd like that job. And, you know, it just started blossoming from there. So, you know, you yeah, just walk in that was door. That? What station was that that you worked this at? This was called uh, CFUV, which was the, the campus radio station at University of Victoria. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. And it was fun. It was really fun. Uh, they really opened so many doors for me. They started saying, hey, we can get you media passes for sporting events. We can get you press passes for concerts. Uh, so I started going to things every night. I was like, wow, holy cow, this is unbelievable. Like back then, man, and you were probably the same age as I was at the time. And, and that was like, it was huge because like you could get into any sporting event you wanted to for free, any concert you wanted to for free. You could get backstage at shows and people were like, so you could you pretty much had a key to the city. Yeah, you know? exactly. And you're like, what, 20? I, I was like maybe 20 years old. And I had like, literally a key to the city any club i wanted to get into for free i could drink for free i could go to concerts for free this was like a golden ticket it kind of got know. a golden ticket. Yeah. no i know i had to, i just felt that way for sure it was like holy cow my life just completely shifted it was a golden ticket it just expanded my mind it made me yeah. think wow like you know i i have the ability to be close to all these people that i really respect for how much they've achieved already in their life and I can be close to it. Maybe it rubs off on me and I can achieve all my dreams and goals and hopes, you know? And so it was fantastic. Like, yeah, I'm backstage. I'm hanging out in restaurants with athletes. I'm going into the locker room. I'm going, yeah, I'm just, yeah. Holy cow. This is just pretty great experience, man. That's very, pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. Very, very great. And it, it just, it just, um, it just made me feel like uh, there's nothing unobtainable if you, if you want it bad enough, if you, you know, put some effort into it, you walk through the right doors, talk to the right people, uh, you, you know, you've got, you know, you've got these possibilities of life happening for you. So it was, yep. yeah, yeah, it's neat to hear, you know, similar stories, you know, you're, you said you, you were in Toronto when you started this. 
No, no, I wasn't in Toronto. CFNY was in Toronto. I was in Vancouver. So, that, oh. so, so David Marsden had moved to Vancouver to start a, a new sort of, it was the first, uh, nice. I think they, at that time they called it alternative rock radio. And it was the first, you know, new music radio station. Everybody else was still playing sort of, you know, older classics and stuff like that. And this was sort of trying to break out into something new. Okay. And uh, yeah, and it, it was great, cool. and it, but it just, it, cool. you know, it couldn't get from the AM dial to the FM dial. It moved from coast 800 to coast 1040, and then uh, and then 1040 applied with the CRTC to get uh, an FM license, and and the and the CRTC didn't give it to him. Uh, I don't know why or what the deal was. I went to the hearings, but I couldn't really, I was too young to really understand how all that worked at the time. So, um, you know, I just know that it didn't happen. And as soon as that didn't happen, then coast 1040 turned into the team 1040. Yeah. Funny yeah. enough, sports guy in there for you. Yeah, no, and they just closed their doors after 20 years, team 1040. Yeah. Uh, all my friends, uh, you know, in the industry uh, lost their jobs. It was a big shock to this city. Uh, I listened to 1040 five days a week for the last 20 years uh, when I was in the city here. And yeah. it was, uh, it was tough, but uh, there's constant movement in, in radio, so you have to go with the flow and, you know, figure out, you know, where you want to be in, in it. So it's, you know, radio is like, it's like film. We both, we both spent time working in film too over the last 10 years or 20 years or whatever it's been off and on. And, and it's the same thing. It's, it's a little bit fluid, you know, which is a joy and a curse in, in all things. Because sometimes it gives you the freedom to, to work on projects like like this, like your podcast. You have the freedom to do that, to build it to a point where you don't need you know other income anymore. And for me, it was always like a, a place where I could go if I wasn't on tour and I wanted to like you know keep busy and I didn't have anybody to write with or whatever. So it was always that thing. And plus, I'm a Canadian musician. You know, we're just broke. That's the deal. <laughs> you know, that's just that if you're a Canadian musician, generally you're living off advances from the record company, and that's just no lie. That's the way it works. You know, um, so, you know, you need some kind of side income, generally speaking. And uh, and if you want to have, you know, sort of a little bit of abundance in your life. And so, uh, you know, it gave me that. And that's it's you know, but it's the kind of th same thing. It's a bit cyclical and you can take on a project for six months or and, and then and not take a project. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool. It's kind Very of cool. Very cool. So as I mentioned, uh, Corey is the lead singer of show Core. Uh, they rose to prominence in the early 2000s. Uh, he left the band DPT. We probably won't get into too much of that, but uh, decided uh, leaving uh, DDT was the right way. Uh, you um, had had some interactions with Terry Murray, uh, Show Murray, and uh, uh, you guys decided to uh, put together a bit of a project and uh, it turned into just an amazing collaboration. If you listen to hard rock stations in Canada in the early 2000s, uh, you would have heard this song. I'm going to play it for you right now. It is bone cracker and uh yeah this was on huge regular play it was a fantastic hard rock song that uh rose this band to prominence i'm the bone cracker i'm the bone cracker i'm the kung fu master i'm the bad guy i'm the bone cracker i'm the bone cracker i'm the cat in your mind and you find all the rap you yeah. In your face, I'm like mace when you're crying You need a back brace of day that they find you Unwind you, unwind you, you'll find they're lethal I'm the b to you, you know, yeah, drill Such a, such a great song, Corey, so fun, uh, man, just rock so many people in parties, living rooms, uh, this song was just everywhere for a really long stretch, it was um, super impressive, and, and it's funny, yeah, it's gone for quite a while, man. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to put a clause to it in a second. <laughs> Yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, as I said, it was everywhere. Uh, how did it feel when you guys put this together and released it and it became a, a big hit? Uh, it was just suddenly everywhere. How did it feel? 
Yeah, it was pretty, I mean, I'd been, the band that I was in before that did a lot of, a lot of stuff that, I, you know, kind of opened me up to the business of music and what was happening in, in the world of, uh, you know, major labels and, and record companies. And, and it was, so I, I sort of had my, my foot in the water there already, it, you know, DDT was signed with Lars Ulrich from Metallica, who started his own imprint label called TMC, the music company, through Electra Records in New York. And, uh, and so with DDT, while the band was sort of imploding, we were out touring with, you know, Kid Rock and Scorpions and Megadeth and, and Alice Cooper and, 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 you know, playing these big arena shows and stuff like that and meeting all these people uh, while the band was in the middle of disintegrating it personally, you know, it, right when your dreams are coming true, they're also falling apart. That's just happened sometime in, in life. Um, it and so, in bands for some reason, very prominent in, in yeah, bands, a lot it, of bands. There's a lot of personalities, and a lot of ego and a lot of stuff that's, you know, uh, that happens behind the scenes and, and all that. And, you know, and, and it's stopped being that stop project stopped being fun i think for all of us everybody involved and, and whether we'd like to admit it or not at the time you know in retrospect i think that was the case and and so um i was kind of asked to leave the band the band was going to go in a different direction and uh and so i was like well i mean that's a bit of an ego bruise uh, but in the same day that that happened i got a phone call from management from ddt's management saying hey i think that the band's going in a different direction i said okay sure um and uh i got my phone rang and it was terry and and he was like hey i just bought a recording studio on commercial drive what are you doing and i was like i just got kicked out of ddt i got a little time on my hands he said you want to make a record i was oh, like cool yeah yeah Amazing. so uh yeah, so like it just was like that serendipitous thing that happens in life sometimes where you're just like, you know, it's just kind of like magic, you know, one door closes and another one opens or a window and whatever the thing is. And and so uh, so I went down to check out the studio uh, and we were like, you know, just talked about what we wanted to do. And I said, well, let's make a record that's fun for us. I want to make stuff like I don't want any bullshit and I want any industry stuff. I want to do this like something that just comes out of us that's for like fun. You know, let's make the record we want to make. No influence, no push, no bullshit. And so, uh, if, funny enough, Bonecracker was the first song we wrote. So, so we were sitting in his basement and uh, we were just like chatting about some stuff and we were listening to some old rehearsal tapes and stuff like that. And there was a, a bass line came on. Boo -doo 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 -doo. I was like, whoa, hold on. What was that? Well, this, and we rewound it, rewound it, rewound it. Okay, okay, let's 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 sample that. Let's sample it. So we took it, and he actually played the sample and looped that bass line. And then I was like, you know, let's let's think about something that goes over top. We need something that's going to be kind of spacey, but but cool. And you know, and he's like fooling around on his keyboard. He's like, you know, playing some stuff or whatever. And we 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 close close. We we that boom. And we're like, we both just kind of looked at each other and went, yeah, that's it, that's it. You know, and the whole song came together so quick. It was crazy. Like that wow. song came together. Yeah, isn't that amazing that uh, it was, you know, the first song, uh, it was just, uh, you know, all of a sudden it just became so big for everyone. Uh, yeah. the, the, one, the one thing that seemed incredible to me is I would hear it at hockey games. I would turn on the TV on commercials. It was on, yeah. on TV shows, uh, video games. It just seemed like, Everyone wanted a piece of that. Uh, how was that whole process when everyone was saying, hey, can I uh, use that? Can I play this song here, there, everywhere? Well, I'll tell you, that bruised ego that I had from uh, the phone call after the TDT thing, <laughs> see, that sure went away quick. Um, you know, I, you were on top of the world for, like anybody, you know, you're only as good as your next single. But if for that, you know, that for that blip in time, it was, it, you we're riding a pretty good wave, man. We got to... We got to do a lot of stuff. We got to play a lot of big shows. You know, I think 30,000 was our biggest crowd and, and like, you know, traveled around, you get taken places and, you know, all this, all the trappings of the rock star lifestyle. We get to, you know, enjoy that kind of thing for a minute. And then it's pretty cool when you turn on the TV and you're hanging out with people and, you know, your songs on a Ford commercial. That's pretty cool. You know, or anytime you're driving in the car and somebody turns a radio song, radio, and that's your song playing. I mean, I can only imagine, you know, like, I guess maybe if you're Nickelback or somebody, it gets a little bit old and they don't care too much. But, you know, I mean, for me, that was the, really the first time that that had happened. And I was pretty excited, pretty stoked. So, yeah.
I have a clip here uh, that I want to play. Uh, it was prominently featured in a locally shot uh, TV show, and I want to I want to sh share that with our viewers and listeners. Uh, it was pretty neat to see this um, this come on, and uh, this is a little compilation. Bone Cracker playing on Smallville. The Superman uh, reboot uh, locally shot here in Vancouver. like the promo for it or something like that the song was yeah, in a that's a little that. clip uh i actually have the other clip as well that uh, it was you know it, it was prominently featured as they were acting and they were they had some kind of fight scene in front of a high school that's right yeah, that's right and the kid flipped over the car and stuff like that yeah and, yeah so that was a little bit of a more compilation clip episodes, i think it was, i think we had a few songs in smallville episodes i think it was like uh we had good talk and then Legendary Camaro, I think, was in an episode, and uh, it was, yeah, I think it was a hand, we had a handful of songs. For some reason, whoever was do, picking the music uh, for Smallville was, like, liked our band. I don't know why or what the deal was, but but thank them, because, uh, you know, that's uh, that was a couple of bucks. It was licensing yeah. worth a few few dollars. Well, I've got a, I've got a little compilation list here of places that, um, that your music has played. Uh, Smallville, Outer Limits. Um, yeah. EA Sports, uh, yeah. video games, uh, soccer, baseball, uh, what else? Uh, wrestling, then yeah. Molson Canadian commercial, Ford commercial, uh, the Canucks in the Wild played it during their game plays. The Giants had it as their um, opening theme. theme song for a while. The Giants, yeah, that was pretty funny. They used it as their theme song for. So did a couple of wrestlers. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's been in movies, Jet Boy. Uh, a rug and a bag of weed. A uh, bug and a bag of weed. That was, uh, uh, but I think that was a different bug. song. I think it was right on, wasn't that that movie? Right on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, prominently portrayed on Hockey Night in Canada, TSN yeah. football, uh, TSN hockey theme, uh, Fox Sports. Uh, just yeah, yeah, pretty amazing, pretty cool, great. Uh, you know, to see that uh, I was a fan right from the start. I was able to get to see you guys in a few places. Uh, I remember seeing you in Whistler. I remember seeing you on the corner of Granville in Georgia. Right. Uh, T, T Fox was an, an early uh, lover of your band. They, they prominently played you. You were part of a Vancouver Seeds compilation, I believe. That's right. And uh, they, they really started playing you a lot locally here. And uh, I feel like uh, we're able to you know, get you some of those local gigs as well. Yeah, man, Seeds was sort of the catalyst. I mean, at the time, uh, Rob Robson was the music director there and, and David Hawks, uh, I think, together, or one was assistant or something. And I'd known David, actually, from my, my years at Coast Radio. Um, and when, when we first started writing the record, the first Choco record, um, I was bringing in to people that I knew industry-wise to, like, 
you know, give them a sort of sample. And the idea was I wanted to get people excited about what we were working on. You know, we were doing this, we're having fun, we're making this thing. And and so when I got mixes, I I would bring them to people who I thought might be interested in them and see what they thought, you know, and people who could, you know, give me some advice and stuff like that. And David and Rob were were two of those guys that, that, you know, we, that Terry and I would go and sit down and and say, here's some new mixes we have, you know, do you think this kind of thing would ever get played on CFAX? Do you think this is the kind of thing, you know, well, just wondering, you know, and, and, uh, and so I think we brought Bonecracker in as a demo one time and, uh, and David Hawks was just like, oh, this is a great song, man. (laughs) We were like, oh, okay. Thank you. So, um, you know, and, and so we, we just kind of built on that and and, uh, and, and and relationships like any business or anything in the world, relationships are so important, you know. And so we, you know, just kind of kept, uh, uh, you know, meeting people and, and trying to get the music to as much people as possible, as many people as possible. So, yeah, I mean, it was... You must have met a lot of great BJs, a lot of uh, DJs, BJs, a lot of great people across the country. A lot of uh, rock radio stations must have wanted to interview you guys, must have wanted to, you know, start playing you. Uh, you said to me that uh, Alberta was a, uh, a really big uh, province, uh, really great for you guys. You always had a lot of fans there. They came out in big support. Yeah, Calgary and Edmonton, man. I, I don't know why, what the deal was, but for some reason, um, but yeah, we just did really well. Like I mean, we did pretty well across the country, but but that was you know even bigger than Vancouver for a time was was Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, I guess there was a. I mean, we played the radio station there was the Bear, uh, and they had uh, every year they had a thing called Erno, the Bear Bash, and I think they did the Halloween Howler. That's right, the, the Bear Bash, and then there was uh, Stage Thirteen, and and so for a few years running, <clears throat> we were. Uh, on the bill for for the bear bash and the Halloween howler and all and these were like you know so 15,000 20,000 person shows I, I if I remember correctly I, around there 10, 10 to 20,000 let's say um, and they were packed and they were wind to get in and it was always like a you know a bunch of big bands and a, and a huge deal so we would play those things and, and every time we do it we'd bring our you know our full production with you know our explosions and our confetti cannons and our dancers and the whole shebang and and uh, and and uh, we played stage thirteen. We actually headlined stage thirteen on the Friday night uh, above George Thorogood. Wow, <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. Wow. Uh, it, whatever it was, you know what? We didn't think we, it was we were the right band for the spot, but we but we did a great job. It was fun. Um, I think I remember riding a Jim Beam bottle across the stage, a big inflatable Jim Beam bottle across the stage like a horse. <laughs> oh wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty yeah, good. Your, your live shows were good. your live shows were really fun. There was a, a you know a lot to watch, uh, yeah. big spectacle. Uh, I guess Linus Entertainment uh, started backing the band and was able to uh, put some money you know into you guys a little bit. Yeah, fair? yeah. I mean, we you know did a deal with Linus um, and, and distributed through Warner. Um, and you know, I, it was, it was good for the time, but it, you know, it, it sort of fell apart on us. I, we had a bit of a, in the, in the, in the later years here, we've had a bit of a tumultuous relationship with, uh, with that label. Um, you know, I don't want to get into any details and, and that kind of thing, but it, it, you know, what, what's happened now is that we've gotten the rights to our music back for the most part. Uh, and so we now control our own masters again. And, and I mean, we, we didn't lose it, but somebody had sort of uh, started collecting money and taking that stuff without, you know, without sort of letting us know. And, and yeah, anyway, you know, uh, it was, yeah, it, it's all over now. And the, the good part is we, we sort of are in control of our own destiny again. And, and that's, you know, part of the reason we're uh, be able to put out all the stuff that we've been putting out lately. So. I want to um, go back a little bit to the beginning. You talked about just uh, sort of hanging around and, you know, suddenly being handed a mic and say, yeah, hey, why don't you be one of our singers? Um, but uh, I heard that you went on a Caribbean cruise and were part of a band that uh, did some country covers. Uh, Willie Nelson. Holy uh, shit, Darren. Where'd you get Waylon this information Jennings, from? Waylon Jennings, things like that. Uh, 
Uh, tell me about that. How did that what occur? What the hell, bro? Where did you find this shit out? Yeah, that's true. I was 14 oh. years old. So wow. I was 14, and, and the guy down the street from me, Big Al, had a, a like, he played country songs just kind of, you know, for the neighbors and, and uh, my dad's bar stuff periodically. So he thought that we we're going to go on a cruise. We should play in this band and uh, and we learned a bunch of, we met a medley basically of, of uh, Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash. And uh, um, yeah, and so, yeah. And, and so his son played guitar and, and, uh, and the, the, the ship guy played drums. I played bass. And the problem was we were, I think we were in the Bahamas the day, the day we played the show. And, and I, I was 14 and I'd gotten into the rums on the Contiki raft or whatever. It was like free rums, right? And so <laughs> parasailing and I'm having some rums on the Contiki raft oh, and I right. get a little, I get a little snackered and, uh, and I'm getting back to the boat and I'm doing the up the, up the walkway thing. They're like, you got a show tonight. You got to play tonight. It's a big day, blah, blah, blah. Ah, whatever. I'll be fine. Right. And I'm 14. <laughs> So they put me in a room and they fill me full of turkey sandwiches. They call room service. They give me a bunch of food and bread and they get for like four hours. I'm in there having coffee and bread. And anyway, I played great. So nice. whatever. Nice. Yeah. So you learn how to be a rock star at 14. That's right. Yeah. Playing in the Caribbean. Because <laughs> uh, that's what rock stars seem to do. They seem to drink all day and then hit the stage and and nobody knows. Oh. Nobody's the wiser. Everybody has fun and uh, right. it's all a good time. Right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah, that's incredible that yeah, it started you, that, at that age and you were able to be, uh, you, you had a free cruise. That's pretty incredible. Uh, be able to go to the Bahamas. Yeah, it's good. It's good yeah. Times. Uh, okay. So let's take you, you even back further. Um, your parents, uh, what kind of music they listen to? Uh, what kind of vinyl did they have? Uh, were, did they uh, influence you and your love of music? Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, my my dad was a big like uh, that, you know, the Willie Whalen, Johnny Cash stuff like that. My dad was, you know, that sort of speed and Neil uh, Neil Young and and um, you know, um, and my mom was more pop, I think, but like ABBA and you know the, the everything in that time that was sort of poppy and and. Uh, you know, on the radio and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, my dad was less radio. He was more like into his own, like the outlaw country thing was, that was huge in our house. You know, that stuff was like, that's kind of the, the stuff that I remember being played most of the time was that because his friends were into it and the neighbors were into it. And, you know, we'd have like, my parents would have parties and stuff and that'd be the music that'd be playing all the time. And then later, you know, my dad passed when he was 60 and I was about, I don't know, 14 years ago now or something like that or maybe 12, I don't know. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and, but then we'd go up to his cabin and that was, that was the soundtrack, you know, okay. up until the day he passed. So, you know, him and I would have a few beers and sing those songs at the top of our lungs in the middle of the woods where nobody could hear us. Right. So, so was that uh, the reason why you wanted to always do the devil went down to Georgia? Uh, no, you know, it's funny. We, we decided that, that was, a, I think it was, Terry and I thought it might be a cool cover to you. We did that song like a, you know, like years ago, uh, live. Yeah. And, uh, and then decided like later on to record it, but we just thought it would be a fun song to play live. That'd be a kind of a cool thing. It sort of fit with our, you know, devil rock disco and the whole show core sort of vibe. Right. Um, and, uh, so yeah. And then when we recorded, we're like, holy shit we'd actually this is a good recording it worked out really well and, and sal's guitar playing is you know phenomenal on that track it's so so crazy good you know like i mean i i know that corn's done a, a, co a cover of it i know that nickelback did a cover of it and you know everybody's got their own sort of vibe on what what the song is and and i mean you know i know it, like dave martone played on the nickelback version of it and dave is a world-class guitar player you know and i definitely would say that sal stands up right beside dave on on his playing in this for sure, you know, on, on our version of it. So are now are you going to play the Wipeout? Is that what you've got queued up? The, the show core Wipeout? How the devil went down to Georgia? You got that thing? Is that what you're going to play? I, I don't know if I have the Wipeout. I'm not sure uh, what you mean by the Wipeout version, but I, I do oh, have no. a, it's, I do have a version that I wanted to play. Okay, well, here, before, okay, before you do, I, I mean, there's a, there, we played a show in Edmonton one time, and it, it was, I think, I, guessing around 2006 it was like a a, a special show at a, at a strip club or something like that where 
we came in to do a private sort of deal. And, uh, and Sal was running around in circles the end to do his guitar solo. Yeah, have you seen this on the internet? I don't no? think so, no. It's no. Somewhere you can find it on the internet. I don't know what, what it's called, but but it's like, and, and, and he, you know, he does uh, and then we and, and I'm going one more time, one more time. And he goes for it one more time. He starts to run and he goes, and his feet just go right up from under and crash. Bomb. Wow. The guitar goes down, he goes down, he goes flying everywhere. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's so, yeah, crazy. <laughs> that's amazing. Anybody didn't get hurt, luckily. No, he got right back up like a trooper he is and that's started amazing. playing it again. Ah, well, we'll have to find that and play it next time. That's great. Yeah, well, let's yeah. Uh, let's find the version I have. It's just the, uh, uh, yeah, just the the, yeah, just the uh, audio version of it. Uh, static, um, static screen behind it. Down in Georgia, and he was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a box, he's way behind, he's willing to make a deal. When he came across this young man song on a fiddle and playing hot, the devil jumped up on a hickory stump and said, Boy, let me tell you what. I guess you didn't know it, but I'm a fiddle player too. And if you care to take a dare, I'll make a bet with you. Now you play a pretty good fiddle, son, but give the devil his due. Bet a fiddle of gold against your souls, think I'm better than you. The boy said, My name's Johnny. Take your bet, you're gonna regret some of the best there's ever been. Johnny, rising up your bow and play your fiddle hard. The hell's broke loose in Georgia and the devil deals the cards. If you win, you'll get this shiny fiddle made of gold. But if you lose, the devil will get your soul. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I'll have to find that wipeout version. That sounds yeah, pretty I mean, it's not even a full cool. song, it's just a clip. The wipeout yeah, thing. Okay, just, just a clip of it. Yeah, well, that would have been perfect. That, that uh, yeah, you're, like, you're, one of the reasons why I wanted to play that, uh, I don't, sorry yeah. to interrupt, one of the reasons I wanted to play that was I really loved your vocal range. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to know that that was your singing if I just found that, didn't have any labels on it, I would have just played it and I would have been, I was amazed. Uh, you have such a great, amazing range there and I love your voice on that, that track. Thanks, yeah. man. Uh, you know what? Yeah. It happened when my beard turned gray. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I actually, you know what? I got a single that's coming out, you know, in the next few months or whatever. Uh, um, Nick Mather and I are going to try to start working on a video for it. Um, but I wonder if, can I play clips for you on stuff like this? It's not like a clip. It's, I wonder if I play it on my, on my thing, if you'll be able to hear it, want to try it for a second and see if it happens? Yeah, let's try it. Sure. Yeah. I'll just play just maybe a, just a couple minutes of it. This Do is, it. Uh, let me see if it works. I mean, I don't know if it will or not. Do, uh, oh, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned Nick Mather because uh, he uh, was instrumental in helping put together the. Oh, hey, hold hey, on. Video. Sorry. Go, go ahead. He was, uh, he was instrumental in helping create that. Uh, hey, hey, rock and roll video. He, yes, uh, filmed he it, edited it, put it together. I'm going to play that in a few minutes here. But yeah, yeah. Him and I are actually working on a couple of things together. We're going to do an NFT art project, which I'd like to talk about too. But here, I'll give you just a blast of this little guy for a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll put it maybe I'll, here. Is that working? Yeah, it's pretty low. Is there a way to turn the volume up on it a bit somehow? Yeah, I'm hearing that now. Could you hear it? Yeah, I'm hearing that now. Yeah. But what you in the early stages, it? it was pretty low. But uh, anyway, so that's I guess I don't know how to you know this technology business isn't my forte. Sorry, brother. <laughs> I was hoping I could link that through so it would come through the sound. Better, but What's that song called? Lost in Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. Nice. There is a lot of um, Texas themes uh, to your music. Uh, I don't know why. It's an accident. <laughs> is it? Okay. I really, you know, I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, yeah, I want to play the Nick Mather thing in a, in a few yeah. minutes, but... Uh, tell me about uh, your band members. You've you've mentioned two of them, but um, 
tell me about some of the current members uh right the current members right now uh let yeah, give me a short little bio on them oh my gosh okay well uh let's start on one side we'll go uh well show we talked about him so you you know show is right he's all good he's playing in men without hats right now just produced a record for them um and uh i think actually I think it might be two records that they're putting out or a record and an EP or something like that. Um, and uh, so and he's doing fantastic. Um, yeah. And we're just looking for some time because of COVID. We're looking for some time to get together and do some writing, but uh, we haven't been able to lately. Brother, um, from, a brother from another mother, I, I kind of believe. Indeed. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and so then uh, Dean, uh, Dean Robertson, Dean is, plays samples and, and sings. He's like my savior in the back, catches all the high parts for me if I can't hit him and, uh, and fills me out where I need to be filled out. Um, and Dean's been in bands in Vancouver for uh, forever. Um, and, uh, and we've been friends for as long, equally as long when we were in our twenties, probably early twenties, we were good friends. Um, and yeah, Dean is just a, you know, he's a fantastic showman. He's a great singer. He's a great front man in his own right um and uh and so then yeah so then sal um you know sal's been in the band since the beginning he's uh he's an original he's an og me and uh and show and sal are the ogs bob is secondary og bob wagner the drummer bob was in econoline crush and he's also in um the uh the mighty one he was in caustic thought years ago before that um, um and you know bob's a monster in the group it's just a monster and um and so yeah so he's also in the mighty one uh and so coincidentally so is the new bass player that was the addition for the last batch of live shows uh and that's tim steinrock and tim steinrock his brainchild it's his band the mighty one that's his own sort of band that he's got going on they just released a brand new record which is fantastic um the, the torch of rock and roll and um yeah that's available on all streaming services right now so uh recently lost a former member uh rich rock rich yes. uh that must have been devastating for you and for the community as a whole he was a kitsilano resident uh just lived for, very close to me here yeah. uh such a huge guy in the uh vancouver uh, music industry um pretty yeah. devastating and uh must have been shocking news to hear yeah, I mean, you, you know, I'd seen him uh, in the last, I guess, the year before. I suppose it was the last time I saw him, and and uh, you know, I, I sort of lost touch a little bit. But him and I were good friends back in the day when he was, uh, you know, he, I guess he's best known for being the bass player in the Matt Good Band uh, back when you know they were at their peak, um, and uh, and he did the Real Mackenzies, and he did, uh, oh my gosh, it, he was in. He was in every band in Vancouver for a minute, at least. He was such a, like, just, he was just a great bass player, for, you know, first of all, and a great guy, you know. Him and I were roommates for a while. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it's been hard. It, it's the last few years. I mean, you know, when, when you start, I think, in the rock and roll thing, you, you, you don't expect that maybe you're going to see past, you know, 30, 35 tops, maybe. You know, it gets a little dicey after that because what are you going to do, right? <laughs> we all, we were all young thinking, well, that guy's 35 now. He should hang up his stuff. And, you know, <laughs> now I'm friggin' 50 and I'm still trying to do rock and roll. What happened? You know, I mean, I'm having fun. That's what it's all about. But like, yeah, man, Rich, Rich was, it was, a, that was a devastating loss. I mean, Jerry Jen Wilson recently passed. And that's a big loss. You know, like there's been so many in the past few years uh, as we've gotten older, it's just, you know, and that's the casualties of the, of the, the rock and roll, I suppose, and, you know, uh, we didn't expect to go as far as we live as long as we did. Some of us, I don't think, I think I'm, you know, I've been living on borrowed time for 10 years at least. <laughs> so I, that's just, you know, uh, but, you but me. arguably I'm in the best shape of my life now. So, I mean, how do you, you know, I, I don't know. Amazing. I, uh, yeah. You told me there was a moment when you turned 38 that seemed to do a, a huge shift for you. You were, a rock star from 14, 18, whatever it was to yep. 30. And then you said there was a mind shift and you, uh, yeah, weren't, you weren't thinking just day to day rock star life anymore. Can you put me, you know, in that mindset? Can you tell me what it was like? Uh, where that, where that shift sort of came from? Well, yeah, man, my dad passed. That was uh, right when my dad passed away and, and, uh, and, 
you know, I don't know what the, it wasn't a conscious shift. I don't think in my mind, it was more of like a subconscious thing where I think maybe I felt like I had to take responsibility. I was the executor of his estate and everything else. And, and uh, I was pretty um, carefree most of my life. I, you know, I just, I did my, my rock and my, like, you know, I lived a pretty selfish lifestyle, I think. Um, and it was, you know, uh, it wasn't bad. I was still loving and caring and, you know, giving to people and stuff like that. But it was uh, my my dad's passing changed the way that I looked at the world. I think I just became more. Uh, I've got to look after my kids. I've got to take care of this. I got to get a house. I got to you know like I got to grow up and get responsibility. And and so I got married and I had another child and I and I you know became responsible and not necessarily you know in that order I guess but it did happen and and. Uh, and, you know, I guess I lived that way for quite a while. And I, I stopped, you know, doing music specifically. I stopped writing. I stopped, you know, being involved in music for quite a number of years. Uh, and then uh, something happened. I don't know what this, what this change was, but something in my mind changed. Maybe it was midlife crisis. You know, I just decided that, oh, I need a Corvette, a Harley Davidson, and I'm going to rock and roll again. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, you know, I'm going to run around the streets naked. Where's my Corvette with my T-tops? Like, I, maybe it was that. I just, I don't know what the, what the click clicked or whatever, but it was again, you know, Terry called me out of the blue. And he's cool. like, hey, man, wow. I just put a, I just put a studio in. I've got a property up in DeRoche. And I've just put a studio and a trailer up there. You want to come over and do some writing? And I was like, I'm free next weekend. Let's make an album. He said, yeah, let's make an album. So we, every, you know, every weekend and, and, and then days in between, we went up to the, to the studio and we started writing and hammering out a new record. And, and within a few months, we, we had it finished, you know, and we were both kind of fired up and excited about it. And then we got a call from a buddy in Edmonton and said, Hey, we'd always promised if we were going to get together again and do a show, you know, we would come and play at his club. And so he just happened to contact us hearing the hints, their whispers in the wind that we started writing again. So we said, yeah, okay, well, let's put a date on this thing so that we have, you know, something to work towards. So we said, all right, let's do two shows at your club in, in uh, Edmonton. And, uh, and those will be our first two shows back. And then uh, let's book a show for Vancouver. And, uh, and then all of a sudden COVID came and cut off our legs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What do you do? Well, somehow show uh, is in your universe, uh, makes that call, uh, shifts and changes your life. Uh, yeah. you, know, you told me about two very, very crucial phone calls that he made that uh, shifted the direction of your life. It's true. Yeah, it's totally true. He just texted me right now as well. So <laughs> I haven't looked at what he said. Though. I'm not going to look at it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, wait. wait I'll leave it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, okay. So you... You had this responsibility, uh, you know, your, your father passing uh, really, you know, started making you uh, think, you know, hey, I got to be yeah, responsible. Uh, that must be very tough because so many people work so many years to reach 60, 65 so they can retire. And then they have their uh, years where they travel the world. They sit around. They just uh, enjoy retirement. When he dies before retirement, that's got to really, uh, you know, make you think wow like i might not have a retirement you know now i've been living responsibly i've been trying to keep be healthy and you know be this family man but i'm not guaranteed to have this retirement uh after work am i yeah i mean you know he he'd been retired he did the 55 retire business i you know i, I always looked at my life as being uh semi-retired anyway i always did what i wanted so it wasn't really like you know I didn't necessarily have to work or have to do these things. I, I lived, you know, I lived my life on the front side and not the back side for sure. Like, you know, I, yeah, I, you know, as much as I worked 24 hours a day doing music and, and doing things that I like loved to do. Um, and, and that includes film for the most part, you know, I enjoy working in film and doing what I do there. So, you know, you know, nowadays I think of it more like, okay, the film projects that we take on, you know, uh, the, the only tough part for me is the amount of hours that were there is the, is the difficult part the actual work I really enjoy. Me, um, same with me. You know, sure. Yeah. And so, uh, so, you know, and, and if it's, if it's, I don't know, as I get on, I don't think, you know, I don't see myself as being fully retired ever. I don't 
think. I think I'll always be doing something. I'll always be, you know, some creating and, you know, doing something with music or with art in some way. Like I was saying, you know, Nick and I are, are also working on another project right now. We're going to try to come up with, well, we're going to do it, actually. We're working on some, do you know what NFTs are, non-fungible tokens? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're working on some some NFTs. Uh, we're gonna do a collection. It's the 20th anniversary anniversary of Bonecracker this year, so we're gonna try to do a collection of uh, of art pieces um, that we're gonna uh, put with with part of the music, uh, and then uh, auction those off uh, in the next sort of six months, hopefully. Uh, you know, <clears throat> in in the uh, in the whole world of of new sort of art. Yeah, you know, and I've yeah, also they, got that has, other ones I'm working on. So that has just taken off and has uh, just been amazing for so many artists, so many creative people. They've been able to, uh, yeah, find a new revenue source, and and people are snapping them up, paying big bucks for them. It's been pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, and it's a great idea, and it's a, it's really cool that you can own these one off, one of a kind things that you know that you only own, and that's pretty cool. So, so yeah, Nick. Uh, uh, Nick, about- Nick Nick's a fantastic artist. I, uh, I love his art. So uh, yeah, putting your music with his art, uh, I think it's going to be a, a huge hit. Yeah, man. Plus, he's a good guy to collaborate with, too. He's a very creative individual, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I want to I wanna show his video or your video that he yeah. uh, put together. Uh, but I do want to, I do want to, before that, I, I, I want to find out uh, if you, if you couldn't create like uh, how do i want to put this you you have found a job where you're creative in the film industry you found uh, this outlet where you get to write music and and be creative um uh where does where does it come from how how do you uh how would you be if you didn't have that creative outlet uh on a daily basis uh, would, how how would your life be boring you know i guess i, I don't know i mean uh, it, I mean, that's not the only things that make me who I am, but it's definitely something that's, I don't know, uh, you know what, it's tough to say. Uh, I don't get to write enough because I'm not that good of a musician. So, uh, you know, I always think of myself as like, I, I'm, I always need somebody else. I need show to, to write with. I can't, I can't do that stuff on my own. I come up with ideas and, and, you know, I can do arrangements a bit and stuff like that. And I'm really good at, you know, like hearing hooks and, and, and things that jump out. Um, but, but as far as like full songwriting, you know, I need a partner. I need, you know, I, I write melody, I write, can write words, I can do, you know, stuff, but, but it's collaboration. It's a collaborative thing to me, you know, too. So I, I need that. Um, as far as other kind of creative stuff goes, you know, uh, I like working with people who are talented, you know, like guys like Nick, guys like, you know, my girlfriend, Allison is incredibly talented. She, she's an artist and, as well. And, um, you know, and where I can articulate something uh, and they can bring that to life or help me bring that to life. You know, that to me is like an exciting creative collaboration. And that's what the fun part about, you know, collaborating on art is, is, is that conversation that, hey, I've had this idea of this thing. You know, I want to do it with this music this way. And yes, and so let's do this, let's do that. Yeah, what about this? What about that? And that whole exchange of information that that makes this thing beautiful and grow. That's what I love about being creative. Oh, sorry, you said, what would I be without it? Well, I don't know, dead? <laughs> yeah. Dead or drunk all the time, I guess. I, mean, <laughs> I guess so, I, yeah. I'm glad you're not without it ever. Uh, it's there. Thanks, it's an outlet for you. So, Thanks, yeah, man. let's play uh, Hey Hey Rock and Roll video here. Sure. When you were way Now 
your band. Yeah, so that was uh that was the single off the latest album. Uh, yeah. The album was released uh, in in 2020, correct? It wasn't even released actually. We were gonna release it, and then COVID, and so I just started releasing songs instead. And and uh, you know, uh, yeah, I never released it as a as an album. There's still I think three or four or five maybe tracks that I haven't put out yet. And and uh, it's you know, it was just a conversation with Terry and I. You know, do we want to just put this album out now and you know and then here it is just blah put it out nowadays to me it's a little more makes more sense to um you know we're trying to uh to to keep writing and to stay current and to keep making music i'd like to keep putting out music like that as we go sort of thing you know so if i just put out 10 songs bam and then wait two years and put out 10 songs bam I think it's it's better to just kind of keep putting them out, you know, and uh, and that that way, hopefully we're going to get together in the next you know month here. We're going to be, start, you know, continue with our writing and I'll be able to put it a few more, put it a couple more, put it some more, you know, and at the same time collaborating with other people like, you know, um, you know, Perry Batista, Perry from Supernatural. Okay, so, yeah, like Perry helped with that. The Hey, hey Rock and Roll video. He's also helping with uh, another video that we're sort of working on right now in the background for Don't Let It Bring You Down. Um, you know, I'm hoping that over the next couple of months, there's going to be uh, a sort of little wave of things that I've got to release uh, on the sort of in the show core world, you know, uh, with the art stuff, the NFTs, you know, a few new songs we've got, maybe a little video from Nick, hopefully a video from Steve Meyer, maybe a video from Perry. All this stuff has been bubbling in the background during COVID. We've been kind of piecing at stuff and, and sort of working when people have time and everything. So you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of creative genius behind me. It's not me. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm just the guy who pulled the strings periodically. <laughs> but That's great. All, all, well, all you're wizards, lucky. Actually, you, all the wizards are the guys working with me. You're lucky. I know that many wizards and uh, great people. I'm glad you mentioned Perry. Uh, he was, uh, I guess, instrumental in helping put together my favorite video of your guys. And uh, I want to play a little clip of that one. Uh, that's I was right. pretty, yes, that's right. He did. The I was pretty. Video. I was pretty excited about this song. Yeah. Uh, being a proud Canadian. There you and, go. And uh, yeah, seeing so many nice, uh, great Canadian scenes in this song. I love it. Uh, what a what a cool video. I'm so glad he put this together. Love it. Uh, just love the video. He uh, he was able to, uh, I guess you guys put out a request for pictures and different yeah. things from people and they sent them in and uh, he was able to put this, edit it together. And uh, man, that turned out amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I think that's going to be played on Canada Day uh, for many, many, many years and so I many people's so. homes. So cool. Yeah, I mean, that was the idea, right? That was, we, you know, hopefully that song was one of those things that people are drinking in a bar on Canada Day, you know, and somebody can sing, they can all sing it together. And I mean, that would be really cool. That, that was the idea for that. I mean, and, and I hope it happens, you know. Yeah. It was weird well, to put it out during COVID, though, where nobody could actually get together in a bar. So, right. You know, we kind of lost that whole momentum of that. But, you know, hopefully it'll live on, you know, and, and be Canadiana. Did that cancel a tour that you had planned? Uh, not necessarily cancel, but I mean, we had planned on trying to go out uh, for more dates for sure. But the idea was we had talked to Hugh Dillon from the Headstones before we'd sort of put this record out. And then when we finished recording, we talked to him again. And, and there was the idea was they were going to go out and do their um, Saints and Sinners or Sinners and Saints with uh, Big Rack and Tea Party and, and uh, Moist. And, and then uh, 
And then once they finish that, go out on their own. And when they went on their own, we we're going to go out and support them on that, uh, that trek. So uh, we toured with those guys a bunch in the past and we, the bands get along really well and stuff. So, uh, so that was kind of a, that was in the works. Um, and, uh, but you know, it was going to happen after. So it probably would have been this year sometime it would have been in 2021 at some point, but, uh, but yeah, I guess that's going to be on hold for a while now. You had uh, Hugh Dillon and Tim White of the Headstones um, collaborate and help you with uh, Evolution. Uh, they, just by the uh, dawn, mostly, yeah. Uh, and uh, Tim played bass on something. What track was that? Shoot. Ugh, I can't remember. Was it Grad 89? Grad 89, I think. Grad 89. Wow, I pulled that right out of my butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, cool. yeah, so, Funny, that uh, song gets so much play on Pandora. It's really weird when, you know, I was talking before about how with all these music apps now, Spotify and your Apple Music and your Pandora and stuff, you can sort of, as an artist, you can track what, you know, where your songs are being played and who's listening and how many plays. And, and, uh, and that, that's a song that gets played a lot in, on Pandora. That song and a song called March get played a lot on Pandora, which are like, those to me were kind of like B-sides a bit, you know, like I never thought of those as, as, as radio songs. But yeah, who that's, knows? That's great. Um, yeah, no, it yeah, is. Really when cool. you, had posted, uh, you had posted that at some point a few months back that uh, we were able to get this many downloads, this many listens, uh, this, this, uh, people listen in these countries, uh, do you have that something that you can pull up right now and, and just list that out? It blew my mind. Uh, you know, how many people that you have reached, how many views, listens? Uh, yeah, it was just an incredible number. And to be able to have that far reaching global, you know, that was. Great. I don't think, I mean, I, I did, I pulled it up for you a while ago, but I can't remember where I put it again. I always forget. It's in my photo somewhere. I took a screenshot of it when I saw it. But I don't know how far back. Is it, it something? Was. Is it something that can, you can look up that's current today? Is that, can you go on? No, it's it's like a they send you a Spotify recap at the end of every year. Okay. So like it would come in maybe like in January. Oh look, there it is. I found it. <laughs> so I couldn't find it. Yeah, it's like um, one of the like that thing there. Yeah. Can you read off those numbers? It was like uh, four hundred twenty-two thousand point five. Stream 420 422,500 streams. It's just you know 126,000 listeners, 88 countries. I mean, there's lots of people with a lot more than that. There's lots of people a lot less than that too. But it's a pretty you know. I mean, that's something that we're proud of. Oh, that's man, something that I, we're proud of for sure. Oh man, that excited me. Those numbers really blew my mind. And yeah, obviously you know, try to compare yourself to anybody. You know, you can be you know yeah. down here or down there but uh you know those are great numbers uh it's amazing that you know people in 88 countries know show see how many country. people are listening to you right now you know <laughs> so there's great. 10 people 10 people are listening to show core right now that's pretty cool right that's really and cool you can look on you know okay well there's been you know 23,000 in the last 28 days or whatever and you know stuff like that where they're from and all that stuff which is pretty neat vancouver calgary edmonton's the top three still <laughs> but then chicago and surrey tell, tell me about um evolution uh you you had uh, devil rock disco big hit uh, you know put you on the map uh, all of a sudden you're touring around then you have to come up with your your second album uh how did that come together and and uh, tell me about that whole process uh well I mean, the recording of it was much the same. It was us in the studio with kegs of beer and our friends coming by. That was, was, it was recorded much the same uh, and it was a great experience. Uh, the difference I think coming out of that was the record company. And that's where um, we sort of disagreed. The record company wanted to put right on out as the first single and we wanted Evolution to be the first single. Our idea was let's go heavy first and then we'll come back with right on after. And, uh, and we thought we could make a way better video. We had this idea for this animated video of like show and I on these like big wheels, you know, like riding the thing for the song, you know, it's like super heavy song and it's us like just riding these big wheels or whatever. And that was like back then before people had already done that video. Um, and uh, we thought it was really cool. 
Um, but the record company just, they would just have no part of it. They just really didn't want to release that song at all as the first single. Um, they really wanted to write on. So, uh, so you know, we, we didn't really have much say at that point. We had to go with what they wanted. And then they put a bunch of money into the video, into the write on video, which it's, a, you know, it's a decent video. I, I don't mind it at all. Um, but I think it costs a lot more than like the Bonecracker video costs about 10 grand and the write on video costs about 60 grand. And to me, it's like, you know, I think the Bonecracker video is just as, just as good, at least, as the right on video, you know? Wow. Wow. So, where, that, where, that, where did that extra 50 grand go? Well, yeah, I mean, and that's, so that, but that's the thing that all of a sudden that money is recoupable to the artist too now. So now we're, we're 60 grand in debt, you know, for that video, but it wasn't our choice Crazy. necessarily to make that wow. Yeah, that's tough when uh, you know creative control is out out of your control. Yeah, and it was well, a little bit. at that point. It was a little bit. So, well, let's yeah. play uh, "Evolution," uh, one of my favorite songs from you guys. Um, I love it. It's a it's another uh, static picture with the uh, lyric or with the music behind it. Uh, you know, definitely love this song. And um, yeah, I wish it was the the first single as well uh, i think it would have uh, yeah immediately we can go Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, one of my favorite songs you guys have ever done, and uh, Thanks, buddy. I loved it when uh, you you played it at the rickshaw. Uh, it gets gets everybody in a great mood. You know, you can start pounding your fist and and banging your head, and a uh, super fun song. It's funny, you know, when we write songs like that, and it, it it really is kind of like that is a thought when we're writing a song like that, like the crowd and what the feedback's going to be and how to how to connect, like you know there is songs where we it just really is about connecting with the crowd and they and we are a live band and that's what we always started as was a live band and so you know um to be able to have that kind of connection with the crowd you know the bring back rock a time rock and everybody gets involved and everybody feels a part of the show and that that shared energy is to me what you know that was what makes an exciting live concert you know so well you have a choice right now i can play your live show at the rickshaw or i can play the right on video <laughs> well, which clip at the rickshaw? Uh, I think this is the intro uh, when you you first start, you, you guys first hit stage. Sure, I'll play the intro. Okay. All right, let's do it. That's Steve Meyer did all this. Thanks thanks to Steve for putting this video Steve together. Meyer. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, I was uh, I was at the show. We uh, we yeah. were a pretty strong crowd, and uh, I was super happy. Uh, to tour again, and uh, yeah, to see a lot. Yes. 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 Yes.
much energy uh great beginning got the crowd into it uh right off the hop and uh how did it feel walking out onto that stage um uh, you know like putting on your favorite pair of pants i guess <laughs> it was uh you know yeah it's i it's funny because i i was when we talked about i haven't played live in 10 years um not before that show i played a few shows just prior to that one but um when we were writing this album and I was, you know, at Terry's place and we were talking about playing live, he'd been playing, you know, for the last few years, um, traveling the world in Men Without Hats, playing guitar um, and doing, you know, sound and road managing. Anyway, uh, you know, he, he'd been out in the world doing live music and I hadn't been involved in quite a while. And so I was like, you know, it's weird. I feel like, you know, like I'm feeling more nervous than I've ever felt before to, to kind of go and do that again and to be there. I'm, a, I'm afraid of like what the pratfalls might be of, of that, you know? And, uh, and, but then as soon as I, as soon as I stepped on stage, it was like, I'd never left. It was, it was, it, you know, I hate to use the old analogy of like, it's like riding a bike, but you know, it, it kind of was like riding a bike. It was really like slipping on, you know, your favorite pair of pants and, and being like, Oh yeah. I remember these and look, I still fit into them. <laughs> I'm just gray now. That's all. <laughs> nice, nice. I still fit the pants. <laughs> could you, could you see familiar faces uh, from the stage? You know what the craziest thing was? Yeah, of course I saw lots of familiar faces, people from the past, new friends, uh, you know, people that I'd known in the last few years. And, uh, and it was great to see like my, my eldest daughter was there. She was able to go to the show now because she's 20 years old. So she's at 22 now, I think, but, uh, but back that she was 20, just turned 21, I guess, or 20, that, that show, I can't was 19, no, it was 2020, right? Yeah. So yeah, she just turned. So, uh, so she got to come to the show with her fiance, which was like crazy to me. Like, you know, like the last time I played a show. Okay. So I, she was so little, we would be driving in the car and we were listening to Sea Fox and I was driving in the car and she was in the car seat in the back. And I, maybe she may have been maybe two, maybe one, two years old, maybe. And Bonecracker comes on the radio. And I'm driving the car and she goes, Dad, you're the big bone cracker, but I'm the little bone cracker, right? <laughs> wow. Oh, God, oh, you me? You, Mark. <laughs> so so that little girl got to come and see me play uh at that big show, which to me was um pretty outstanding, man. That's a pretty big moment in my life for sure. That's that's got yeah that's got to be a great dream come true to yeah. come full circle like that and actually yeah. you know have her see you perform live oh yeah definitely was yeah, yeah. no it was I like seeing you there that was really the highlight of my day <laughs> oh good. yeah right yeah <laughs> yeah no it was hey, it, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great to get together with uh, so many of our friends yeah uh, anticipated we went for some pre-beers obviously we chatted about it we were all excited and we went yeah. on mass there it was great to get together with people that love you and people that you know from your new life and uh you know starting yeah. to you know shift back to your old life a little bit uh it was so great to be a part of it i wouldn't have missed it for the world it was just a tr treat to be there thanks man yeah it was it was a treat to be there myself too so uh, those show, so those shows at the bourbon um those were the first ones correct yeah, yeah. yeah. okay and it was that nervous energy the butterflies in your stomach uh you know everything was just like holy cow uh, i'm doing this again uh the, the those shows were they any different from the rickshaw to there you, you didn't have probably as many familiar faces it was, it was a smaller room so it was a it was a bit of a different experience but uh you know it was still just as exciting and and uh and it was great to to do that for our friend Polly who whose club it was because <clears throat> Polly's been a supporter of the band since day one you know he's always been a big big supporter of our band so so to do that show do those shows for him was uh meant a lot to us you know and we know it meant a lot to him so what's so the, uh, what's the first album cd tape you ever bought me oh yeah. shit uh I think it was 45s back then 
probably. Um, and I think it might have been, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but it was in my collection. Blondie, I think, um, was there. Uh, what else did I have? 45s. The first album that I owned, I think, was uh, Dirty Deeds. I believe Dirty Deeds, ACDC, uh, and Number of the Beast. Um, uh, that was all kind of the same, I think it's around the same time. Dirty Deeds, Number of the Beast. What else did I have then? Oh boy. And, and, and people bought albums for you too then. So, I mean, I, you know, but I, those are ones I, I spent my own money on, you know, for sure. What was your yeah. first concert? Uh, April Wine and Corey Hart. No way. Wow. Yeah. At the Coliseum. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Two yeah. great Canadian acts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, that was my first, I can't remember how old I was, but I guess maybe like, 13 or something like that or 14 maybe but yeah but april wine it was somebody in my high school was a huge april wine fan and I'd, i think i had the um nature of the beast record april wine nature of the beast right and uh so we went there and then yeah and cory hart was the opener so that was did you was ever cool. find yourself standing in a crowd looking up at the band thinking man i know what i want to do with my life um kiss when I saw Kiss for the first time, I was, okay. I was I really want to do that. That was amazing. Were they in makeup? You know what? It was a non-makeup, actually. It was a non-makeup tour. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and But I was just like, like just the whole, the bigness of it, the, the, just the, the, the greatness, the, the majesty of the show was such a, a deal, you know? Cool. Uh, makeup or not, it was just such a big deal. Um, and so I think I kind of like, I mean, you know, I don't know. It's funny when I was like a little, when I was like grade, uh, you know, before grade two, I guess I was shy. I was super shy kid. And then they, they, uh, they thought they'd try to get me out of my shell by getting me to host an assembly at school, which was, you know, I mean, I was probably scared shitless. I was, you know, grade two, right. I don't know. And, but, but I did it. And then the applause and then the pats on the back and all the adulation. And then I think you created a monster, you know? Like it kind of was like after that, then I was in the school plays. Then I was, you know, trying to like, you know, learn stuff so I could do some music in the school or trying to do some performances in the school. And, and so it really took me out of my shell. It was, I was sort of pushed. It was that throw them in the deep end and, and let, let them learn to swim thing, I guess. You know, they, they just put me in front of the, the, the school and, and I just, you know i found my feet somehow so fantastic yeah. yeah yeah i heard you were a kiss fan i was part of the kiss army uh, i actually got my face painted up a few times for halloween went out yeah. with some buddies uh, you know portrayed that uh yeah, was probably i think kiss was my first album i ever bought uh kiss alive Kiss alive and, yeah and uh i i went to see kiss when i was a young young kid and it it made a massive impression on me as well it was yeah. uh Holy cow! Look at this! Like their 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 stage presence, the grandeur of it. You know, like you just mentioned, it was uh, it was very 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 impactful for me. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. you know all the concerts. I have, I have a couple of uh, Gene Simmons books here. Oh uh, God! <laughs> I like the band. I'm not sure if I'm into his. This is Kiss and Makeup, and this is Sex yeah. Money Kiss uh, autograph copy. Money. Actually, amazingly oh. enough. Um, wh what do you think about Gene Simmons and how he was able to monetize so much of Kiss? He was able to just make him and Paul Stanley, uh, as their co to collaborators, they were able to just become mega, mega, mega rich o over this, this band. And there's, you know, a million bands like them, but, uh, you know, the money, able, the, the money that they were able to generate from Kiss is just phenomenal. Yeah, the licensing that they've done and the, and the with the name and branding is crazy, man. And uh, you know, I mean, if you had told me how that all works when I was, you know, twenty, I would have probably gone, "That's bullshit. No way. No way." You know, he's not an evil businessman or anything. And not that it, you know he's an evil businessman. He's not. He's just a smart guy, and he knew how to figure out. You know, he just figured out how to how to work the business, how to work the industry, and and uh, and I think to his benefit. You know. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a smart guy. I don't know if I agree with a lot of his, you know, personal beliefs and things like that, but I mean, whatever. He's a, you know, 
uh, he's a smart businessman and he's made a lot of money. And, and if that's what your goal is, then, uh, you know, mission accomplished. He's certainly done that. No, uh, very smart businessman. Um, yeah, uh, you know, obviously you never agree with everything a person does or says, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, he's he's done really well for himself. And I was a part of the KISS Army back in the day. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it had a big influence on me. I, 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 you know, I grew up to love music. I, I, I walked into the radio station one day and yeah. my station manager came to me and he said, you know, Darren, you look terrible. You look like you're just about to drop dead today. He's like, uh, have you slept this week? And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, no, not really. And he said, uh, you're burning the candle at both ends. You're going to either a game or a concert every single night and you're partying after. And, you know, I can tell it's really catching up to you. This doesn't look good. He said, if you ever want to be successful, you have to choose one or the other. You have to, you know, you can't do both. There's no way. And I was like, what is he talking about? And, but it, it had so much impact to me that I thought yeah. about it for weeks and weeks and weeks after. And I realized that I really wasn't living a healthy lifestyle. I was just partying, you know, living day to day, uh, trying to enjoy myself, being out every night. Uh, but I finally thought, yeah, maybe, um, maybe I will uh, make a choice. And my choice ended up being sports. And the main reason was I started looking at the older people in the industries, both of them, and there wasn't a lot of older people in music. Uh, they were dying. There was that 27 years old threshold where a lot of rock stars were dying. And uh, it was tough. Um, the lifestyle that made me make that choice. Uh, did the lifestyle make you make the choice of music because of that party lifestyle, the you know rock star existence, being a nomad? Uh, did you want to gravitate towards that because of how it was? Yeah, I think that's part of it. Sure. I mean, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, uh, you know, money, girls, alcohol every day, if you want it, drugs, whenever you want. Like, I mean, that's to a, to a, you know, young, to a teenage boy of our era, that was like the Holy grail. You watch Motley Crue videos and you go, that's the life I want right there. You know, like that's, that's where our heads were at back then. Those guys were our Babe Ruth's and our, you know, like that was, those were the people that we looked up to. I mean, I played sports and I had, you know, sports guys that I looked up to the Gretzky's and I was a hockey kid. So I, you know, I was into that stuff too, but these rock stars and their lifestyles that I saw that was portrayed in the magazines and all these videos, once, once you had MTV and much music and stuff like that, that was like, booga. You know, like, what the hell? This is real? I mean, it must be, you know, not that off of uh, the, the hip hop guys now and the, the bling and the, and the cash and the, all that stuff. And, you know, like that's, you, you see that thing and you go, I want that. That's what I want. And you're just a kid, right? And, you're, and your brain goes, zap, zap, zap. That's exciting. So that's, yeah, I mean, that's part of it for sure. I mean, the thing that I didn't realize, I guess, back then is that you know, that what I was doing and what I'd missed in the last 10 years that I sort of didn't sort of write that much um, was that creative outlet that, you know, I didn't really realize that was part of it for me. Part of it was coming up with a stage show. Part of it was coming up with a lyric. Part of it was coming up with song ideas and working with somebody and collaborating and making a ball of, of a ball of something that was magical that came from nothing. Like this is a song. Where did it come from? I don't know. Nowhere came from the universe that's where it came from thanks you know or whatever it is that's you know that you're making and I think that's to me that's like the 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 biggest part of it now that I can that I can see that I didn't realize was happening back then I asked you this question and you didn't give me a very good answer before I'm hoping oh. you can come up with a better answer this time but uh craziest road story uh you said you you have just uh, not a lot of memories because uh, you just were, you know, partying so much and living day to day. But craziest road story. You got to have one that you can tell at a dinner party or, I, or you know, you know it's hard to company find one two guys like me and you. You know, I, there's things that I couldn't tell at a dinner party. Absolutely never, ever. Um, there is a story that does come to mind, I guess, that was pretty interesting, I suppose. We were in... Uh, 
um, Chicago and uh, we were playing with Kid Rock and it was Joe C. Do you remember Joe C was the uh, uh, yeah, person his that sidekick? Was, yeah, that was with, yeah. and so it was his birthday this day. And um, I, well, I can't remember what the, the place we were playing at, but it was a great old theater, really cool. And, and the top floor was where the band rooms were. And so uh, it was his birthday. So after the show, you know, Kid Rock and everybody became, came off stage and we all went up to this room. Oh my God. And so he had, um, there was a tarps down and there was, uh, you know, some ladies came out all oiled up and some whipped cream and some stuff and some and and they were getting wrestling and a bunch of them on the mats wrestling and doing their stuff and you know i mean use your wildest imagination of what that could turn into backstage at your teenage dream rock show so you're a 14 year old boy imagine what could have happened if, if you use your imagination. that happened that day and i witnessed it and that was the craziest probably thing that i think i'd, I'd ever seen on the road and and that's uh, and i was taming that down for you like crazy it was a bit nuts dude you um you ended up moving to chicago you just mentioned that chicago you ended up moving to chicago how'd that happen yeah just uh you know i was doing film stuff shoker wasn't doing much uh, and i got offered an opportunity um uh, and so i i took it for a minute and um and uh, i loved every minute of it you know it's pretty fantastic i love the music scene there i love the people there um and uh and yeah it was just a great opportunity to uh to sort of step out of my life here and in bc and in vancouver for a while and, and to to experience something new and something different and and, uh, and and change it up you know um so yeah um and then you know i came i came i think i came back sort of that that's part of when the fuse got lit to start creating again you know I think being there and doing that stuff and and uh, and and then coming coming back was when my was when my fuse got lit to start actually you know thinking or bubbling stuff was happening in my brain again. So, how uh, how great is it that you were part of the supernatural team? Uh, must have been uh, great that um, you were part of such a legendary locally shot uh, show. And uh, yeah, know all those guys so well. Uh, you guys worked together off and on for years. Yeah, and I'm proud of that experience. I'm I'm uh, humbled that I was asked to be a part of that. Um, uh, you know, that was like I said, longest running show in Vancouver history. So um, to be a part of it as long as I was was um, was um, you know pretty humbling. That they're all great people and that whole crew and and including the actors. Uh, you know, everybody involved in that in that show and that production was uh, is top top shelf for sure. Um, so yeah, that was, it was, it was awesome. It was really great to, to get a chance to work with, you know, a lot of these people are legends in Vancouver now that nobody met because they were on that show so long, <laughs> you know, oh, there are whispers of a guy named Perry Batista, Perry Batista, who's that? Oh, <laughs> Paul Burton, what, who is this magical Burton creature? Like, you know, they, they, that's, that's sort of the way it was. They were on that show for so long that nobody really even knew who they were, but they were sort of legendary from before that. So, yeah. So I, I was I was humbled and, and it was a great experience for me. How did uh, how did you get into film? How did that start? Oh, it was an accident. You know who got me into film? Rich Rock, actually. Rich Rock got me into film. So Rich and I were roommates and he was uh, working with a guy named Jim Thorburn. Uh, and he was Jim was decorating a show uh, and Rich was helping. Uh, Rich couldn't make it to work gave Jim my phone number and said, hey, uh, this guy will help you out on, on this film. And I'd never done anything in a film before. And uh, and so I went in and that was my first day. And it was like, I was like, oh, hey, well, this is pretty cool. I can, you know, I can totally do this. And uh, and then Jim and I became fast friends. He kept working, which meant I kept working. And then I met Grayson and then Grayson and I kept working. And 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 so, yeah, it was just kind of a snowball thing. You meet people and you have some fun and you, and you, again, you're sharing a little bit of creativity with the things that you're doing and, and you're, uh, and you're, you know, and you're creating something new and exciting. So, yeah. So rich, rich rock got me into film. Funny enough. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, um, I find it very creative. I'm really glad I uh, ended up uh, bumping into it and deciding to, go with it, uh, meeting great people like you, like Nick, like Perry, like a lot of the people uh, out there. Uh, we've, we've had some fun times. Um, film is great. Uh, you, you did mention the hours and that's the only drawback I find is just, they uh, expect you, you know, there for way too many hours. And I have so many other things that I want to do. 
with yeah. those hours. So if uh, if I could go a lot less hours, um, yeah, I, I think I you know might not look at uh, making a change, but um, it's been fantastic. Uh, that it, it, we are very creative. Uh, I am proud of a lot of the things that I've been able to do in the film industry. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And for sure. Do you have any regrets? Uh, any regrets of life? Uh, anything that uh, you know nags at you? Uh, is there anything that you you can think of when you uh, look back? You know, I haven't thought about it. So um, off the top of my head, I don't think I have any regrets. Off the top of my head, I would say that I've been pretty uh, blessed to uh, have been, you know, on the path that I'm on and, and uh, experienced the things that I have. And and uh, and I feel lucky that I've got to do uh, a lot of the things that I've gotten to do. And and, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm just incredibly grateful for the experiences that I've had, I think, you know got lost on a desert island uh, what would the f top five songs that you would like to have on a playlist uh, on your phone on some device uh, oh, where, where would you yeah what God. songs would you bring with you dude i don't know holy crap that's crazy you know what like i don't know like albums i'd like i'd take a you know beastie boys paul's boutique check your head i would take um you know i'd take like number of the beast i'd probably take back in black i'd probably take, you know like it, like but then I need, like, I wake up every, every weekend I wake up and, and, uh, and, you know, I come into my, my dining room area and I have like some chairs where my girlfriend and I sit and I put on pure jazz radio. <laughs> and I just like, we just drink coffee and, and listen to Dave May on pure nice jazz radio. Start the day. Dave May from Pure Jazz Radio in New York. It's like nice. a co-op radio program from New York. And, uh, and I listen to whatever Dave May is just spinning me on the jazz to, and like and 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 to me that's like um uh, it's just it's that's like where i'm happy in the mornings these days you know like i could i guess you know i, I don't mean to be that old guy on the porch with the rocking chair or whatever you know but but like i just like that's you know if, if i'm on a desert island i kind of want pure jazz radio don't tell the rock fans you know <laughs> okay, I hear you. i'll still dip my toes in i you know here's the thing i love I love radio for radio's sake, and I'm sure you do too. Like, like, okay, when I'm putting out Hey Hey Rock and Roll, when I put it out to radio for, for tracking it as a single, I did all that myself because I don't have a record company. So what I would do is like, you know, because we have the uh, uh, ability now, I, I can listen to the rock radio station from every market. So a lot of times what we'll do here at my house is, is we'll just do that. I'll put on, hey, Google, play me The Bear in Fort St. John. Hey, Google, you know, so play, me, play me The Rock in Oshawa. You know, and, and so then I'll listen to the different, uh-oh, Google's playing it right now. Hey, Google, stop. <laughs> it heard you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's so that's, that's kind of what, what I do. And, and I'm, I'm a, and people are really into playlists and, and the streaming and stuff like that. And I do a little bit, but, uh, but a lot of the stuff I listen to is I like, I like radio. I like listening to old school FM radio on my computer or my Google or whatever. So I, you know, I don't mind the commercials. I don't, I like the DJs, generally speaking. And I like the, the banter and stuff like that. Like it's, it's something I grew up with, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with you. And I'm glad that you made that, uh, you know, you made those statements. Um, I don't think every rock fan has to think that that guy wakes up every morning and he listens to the number of the beast immediately and and no you know no classical no jazz no other genres can come in it has to be just straight hard rock and roll so i, I don't think you got to worry about that uh, you you helped me um get introduced to tanner bozer who was a great yeah. guest of ours a couple of weeks ago and uh, i asked him about your music and how much uh you know hard rock heavy metal does he like and he said no i like folk yeah. and it was like really whoa my eyes i think really went wide and i'm like folk okay uh, i'm not super familiar with folk uh, tell me about it and uh yeah so it was uh you know interesting i love when people have ma many different genres of music that they love because yeah there's different times for different things yeah i agree I agree. So yeah, I couldn't pick five songs for Desert Island. I couldn't pick five songs, but what I would definitely like is a radio transmitter. And that way I would be, you know, set up for whatever I wanted. So. What about at your wake? Oh God. Really? <laughs> wow. Same kind of stuff. Dude. I don't know. I don't like, I'm, am I even going to have a wake really? I don't know. I'm a pretty, I don't know. 
just burn me and have done with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was in the crowd watching you sing and enjoying your show at the rickshaw. I have a, a video of you in the crowd singing, enjoying some music. Uh, the tables were turned a little bit. Uh, I love this video. I can't wait to uh, for your what? reaction when we uh, we portray. God, what this. is this? This is going to be awesome. Oh, that's Tanner. There you are, right in the front row. Yeah, Hello, buddy. Join yeah. the version of Billy Idol. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you were, man, uh, yeah. waving your arms, uh, enjoying the front row rock band concert karaoke yeah. to Billy Idol. Uh, Absolutely. Pretty awesome. Absolutely. Oh, oh we're <laughs> it didn't stop on me. Uh oh. Yeah, Diener, he's a killer singer, man. Yeah, he's pretty cool, cool huh? Now you're out of the real Billy Idol? Yeah, that went on the real Billy Idol for a second there, yeah. Yeah, so pretty cool. Uh, that was that's been fun. Was uh, that later on that evening? Yeah, or? That, was, yeah. Uh, that was like after party from the show, yeah. Okay. There at the rickshaw or somewhere else? No, it was somewhere else. I'm down the street. Uh, I don't know what the club is called. I can't remember. Oh, okay. I think maybe, I know they have the karaoke at uh, Funky's down. That's what it was. That's what it was. Funky Winker Beans. That's what it was. Yeah. I wanted to say pig and whistle, but I knew that wasn't right. So I didn't say it. So <laughs> yeah, it's funkies. That's right. Yeah, well, we're uh, we're running out of time. I do want to uh, I do want to show uh, one more video of the uh, the concert at Rickshaw. Uh, while you were there at that show, uh, was that Rachel Ashmore standing beside you uh, just while you were watching Dean sing? I don't know. I didn't see. I couldn't, I wasn't looking at her. I don't maybe quite possibly it was but um yeah. she was a uh, a guest singer um yeah at the show and uh, i want to show the little clip of that okay perfect oh boy <laughs> do I you can't find it do i still have it thought i had it up here let me see uh, maybe got rid of it when you got rid of the billy idol <laughs> oh funny awesome. okay translation I don't see it. I'm That's going to play a band called the Lonely Islands. Fantastic yeah. local band as well. Yeah. You know, check those yeah. Out. And uh, Rachel's uh, also been in Men Without Hats uh, a lot over That's the right. years. Yeah, That's her. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Her and Louise were uh, in Men Without Hats with with uh, Terry. That's how. Uh, That's how. Well, actually, no, he knows her besides that as well. But but yes. Hey, let's go. play the uh, video. Good talk. Oh no, this is it. Yeah, I did find it. Yeah. There it is. Oh, the stink is a little bit empty. Look at little dance move, eh? Yeah. Love it. 
So that was a fun collaboration. I was glad you brought her on. She uh, she's great, and uh, yeah, you yeah. guys you guys seem like you had a lot of fun on that song. We did. That song was originally when we recorded that version on uh, Evolution. The uh, the it was um, Holly McDarland did that part actually on the uh, on the album. So Canadian legendary rocker Holly McDarland. Yeah, uh, yeah. We always remember Numb, uh, one of the. Right biggest yeah. canadian songs ever so yeah yeah man well uh this is fun um i definitely think we're gonna have to do it again because you've got nfts coming out you've got new songs coming out with nick mather yeah. you've got stuff with perry you've got yeah. stuff with show uh there's going yeah. to be new stuff coming out all the time and uh I, once this covid is done everybody gets their vaccinations there will be another tour i'm sure so uh, yeah we're definitely gonna have to do it again as long as I keep my hips in order and my bones not breaking, like it'll be okay. My bones not cracking. <laughs> I love that story about uh, Autumn uh, saying she's the little bone cracker. That uh, that that's amazing. That must have warmed your heart and made you yeah. you know feel like, oh man, this is so great. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. pretty awesome. What what a circle to have that happen and then her to see the show. That was the first sort of show she got to see live. So. I, rem I remember Grayson telling a story to me. Uh, you weren't even in the room, and he said, "Yeah, it was so fun. We're driving down the road one day, me and Corey, and all of a sudden, Bone Cracker comes on the radio, and he's, you guys are both like, hey, oh, check it out.' And you said, "Yeah, I think that gave me ten cents." So. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, yeah. 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 So, maybe next time we'll do cribs and I'll walk you around the house the bone cracker built. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh I'm I'm loving this. Uh I really appreciate this. Uh we are going to post this soon. It won't be posted today, it won't be posted immediately. We are uh launching a new music platform with our podcast, and so uh, it's going to be closer to the end of this month where we're gonna see this uh and i'm gonna launch it all at the same time i'm gonna have uh, our friend nick mather on as a guest coming up and and we're gonna get a lot of people that you and i uh, are familiar with in the music yep. scene around vancouver so uh Perfect. it's it's very cool to uh be at one of your shows 20 years ago Thanks, and uh years later become friends and now uh you know you're helping me launch uh this music podcast i really appreciate your time and uh, the candor and this was fun for me i really enjoyed it a lot i hope you did as well thanks buddy knock it out of the park i love your podcast it's great thank you thanks, thanks for having so much us. enjoy your time off and uh keep in close contact um yeah anything that gets released let me know i'll uh, i'll put it out there through this platform and uh we'll Try to get you thousands and thousands and hopefully eventually millions more listeners and money and everything that you want to have. So let's do it. All right, brother. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Cheers, brother. Take care of yourself and we will talk very soon. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. I'm going to just uh, share our sponsors and partners with uh, all of our listeners. Uh, lots of times I put it in the middle, but didn't want to interrupt this time. So Let's uh, pull that up right now for all of our people and uh, make sure we give credit to the people that are really great at helping us with this podcast platform. Anchor has been a fantastic partner and sponsor for Complete Sports Media. Really great at posting on multiple podcast platforms. And they call themselves the easiest place 
to make a podcast. So you go to anchor.fm, follow the details, and they will be, get you set up, and you can do something great like we just created today. Uh, Berbero, uh, the hockey equipment and apparel company, industry leader in technology, performance, and value, and the V350 stick is something you need in your hands if you're a hockey player. And if you know a hockey player, buy one. Pampas and Possibilities, they design and sell dried florals, do floral arrangements and installations. They are designers of handmade curated things with West Coast vibes at very reasonable prices. And Forever Living, the Aloe Vera Company, they grow and manufacture aloe vera based products for health and beauty. So you just got to go to completesportsmedia.com and go to our partners and sponsors page. Uh, click on the links that you see here and you're able to go and purchase products at reduced rates. So completesportsmedia.com is the details there. So thanks, uh, Corey, for joining us. Thank you, all the viewers and listeners on all the podcast platforms that we're on. Appreciate your support as always. And uh, we look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Take care of yourself. Love you. Bye for now. We're going to... Uh, send you off and uh, we can't wait to, to see you again. Take care. Bye for now.